Hey everybody, Dr. Dan talking. Welcome back to our final lecture for Film 1601, Introduction to Film Analysis at the University of Iowa. Today we'll be talking a little bit about digital cinema. So specifically, how have digital technologies changed cinema? This is a huge question. So I'm not going to necessarily say everything that there is to say about this subject in this lecture. But I do want to suggest some of the ways that digital technologies have changed not just how movies are made, but how they are watched and how they tell stories. Because these are questions that have been on people's minds for a lot over the last 20 years, and they have only become more pronounced questions in the last few months as current events radically change how people in the movie industry are thinking about their jobs. So let's take this step by step. Step one. How have digital technologies changed how movies are made? Well, the most obvious ways that digital technologies have changed how films are made are digital visual effects. So I'm putting here two very famous uh, CGI characters that you should familiarize yourselves with at some point in your time here as film students. Uh, but Robert Patrick from Terminator 2, the first all-computer-generated character in movie history, if I'm not mistaken and Andy Serkis's memorable portrayal as Gollum in The Two Towers, which was a remarkable performance, should have been nominated for the Oscar, and arguably wasn't because Academy voters had no idea whether to classify what he was doing as acting or as animation. Because Gollum is one of those characters, like the T-1000, where the magic is coming through an interaction between what the actor is doing and then what hundreds, if not thousands, of animators are doing in collaboration with the actor. In addition to seeing computer-generated acting creations, you might have also seen one of the countless CGI cities that have been created in the movies in the last 25 years. I'm sure that many of you are thinking about films such as the Star Wars films. I've included here a, a screen grab from the third film in the prequel trilogy, Revenge of the Sith, the all-digital city of Coruscant, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, doesn't exist anywhere in the real world. Completely a creation of many, many talented artists working at their Macintosh computers and creating just a city that only exists in our imaginations and on our hard drives. Another one that you may have seen that doesn't initially scream CGI is uh, the 1969 San Francisco waterfront that opens David Fincher's film Zodiac. And I'm throwing this one up there to underscore that this transformation that has been affected by digital technologies on how art directors and set designers and the mise-en-scene people, how they do their work, is really profound and is not simply limited to science fiction, fantasy, action, superhero movies. You also see it in historical dramas like the film about the Zodiac Killer, where the CGI was used because this is not what San Francisco looks like in 2007, and they wanted historical accuracy. So they used these technologies to transport us back in time, so to speak, to a San Francisco that doesn't exist anymore. So these examples are here to suggest how digital technologies have really changed the basic elements of film form. And I'm not going to talk as much about cinematography or um, editing or sound in this particular lecture, but rest assured that you could say similar things about how digital technology has changed those elements of film form as you could say about what it's doing to acting or mise-en-scene. Another big change that you should know about 
with digital technologies in film is that the material base of film production is very, very, very different now than it was a hundred something years ago, even 20 years ago. And that's because many, many filmmakers are not using 35 millimeter film stock. Some are. Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, Christopher Nolan, a few other names of that stature are very vocal about wanting to use 35 millimeter film stock for as long as possible because it has a texture and a grain and a quality that digital simply does not have. Doesn't mean it's necessarily better or worse, although personally speaking, I think it's way better, but it is different. It looks different. 35 millimeter film looks different than digital film. So some directors are still holding out for 35 millimeter film stock, but a lot of filmmakers, especially a lot of younger filmmakers, are switching to things like this, the RED digital camera and its many, many successors. These all digital cameras where instead of exposing light onto a chemical piece, a piece of chemical and exposing an image that way, they are capturing images in front of them in the language of computer code. And why some filmmakers really, really love this way of working, even though they acknowledge that you are losing something very special when you, when you get rid of that chemical process and all of the crazy stuff that it can do for your movie, is because you can shoot like thousands of takes on this and you never have to pay Kodak or anybody like that a dime. You don't have to buy film stock. You are not limited any longer by how much film you can put in the camera or by what kinds of light will overexpose the film no matter what you do versus the light that you need to capture an image. So it's a very convenient way of working and it makes filmmaking more economical, arguably. But anyway, you, you see these digital technologies being used in a wide variety of different movies. Um, so on the left, Star Wars Episode Two is famously one of the first films that was using this technology, this digital, entirely digital process of filmmaking. And in 2002, it was a huge deal. Nobody had done something like that before, and nobody was really sure that there was a long-term future for this mode of practice. Uh, but flash forward you know, 20 years, and it has become increasingly the norm for how these movies are being shot. But again, not just science fiction. Uh, in 2008, Steven Soderbergh made this four-hour film about uh, Che, uh, Ernesto uh, Guevara, uh, the, the man who was famously partnered with Fidel Castro during the Cuban Revolution in the late 1950s. Uh, and this is a four-hour, two-part film, and the only way that Soderbergh could make something this monumental and expansive but also on a relatively modest budget, was to forego the complicated and expensive process of using film entirely. Uh, and it leads him to make some really interesting aesthetic choices. So check out, check out both of these films. They're really great. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, you have the increasingly common practice of shooting commercially marketed films on iPhones. Uh, so two films worth noting are uh, Sean Baker's Tangerine, which my uh, students in American independent cinema will be watching this week. A uh, movie shot entirely on an iPhone uh, about a transgender sex worker. And the iPhone very much is not just something that keeps the cost of the film down so that they can explore a subject that Hollywood is sadly not all that willing to explore on its own terms, but it also allows the film to have a real grounded on the streets immediacy that you don't necessarily get from the more traditional filmmaking process of using 35 or even 16 millimeter film. 
I also want to put a shout out in for Steven Soderbergh's uh, recent film Unsane, which I thought did a really excellent job of like theorizing and thinking through the effects of using cell phones on what kinds of stories movies can tell. So in simple English, that means I liked how the entire plot of the film arguably revolves around how the people in this uh, mental institution are not allowed to have cell phones, but she needs cell phones to tell the world all the bad things they're doing. So it's a horror film, but it's, 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 it's kind of using the horror film trope as a means of thinking about what does an iPhone do for our movies? Really, really great films. Check them out. Both of them. So anyway, I could talk all day about how digital technologies have changed film production, but the, uh, that's only one part of the question, right? The other part of the question is how digital technologies have changed film reception, film consumption. So in simple English, how have digital technologies changed how we watch movies, how we see movies? Well, the big thing that's happened here is the DCP. So this is effectively the same shift as the one I just described from 35 millimeter cameras to like digital reds and other digital cameras and iPhones and so on. But this is on the, the reception side. So when you go to a movie theater, you no longer see, as you did uh, as recently as 10 years ago, uh, a strip of 35 millimeter celluloid being projected onto a big screen. 99 times out of 100, you are seeing a digital cinema package. You are seeing basically a big hard drive, which contains a super high resolution transfer of whatever movie it, 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 it contains. And the projectionist no longer has to get up there and literally thread the film into the spools and change the reels every 15 or 20 minutes or repair the films if the film strip breaks for some reason. You no longer have any of that very, very skilled manual labor going into the simple fact of a movie being projected in front of you. Instead, uh, the projectionist basically just takes that hard drive, plugs it into a projection, projection machine, types in a password that has been given to them by the studio, and bam, there you go. And so if you're one of the people who are going to the movies in the last year or so, or the last couple of years, and found yourself complaining, like, why is the projection kind of not that great looking? Why is this sort of out of focus or misframed? If you've ever had any of those experiences, this is one of the consequences of the DCP is that it doesn't you don't have to have a union anymore. You don't have to have training. You can literally hire anybody off the street and you are getting a lot more people who are just like, they're literally just pushing the play button and then they're just, they're just, that's, that's it. That's all they're going to do. So yeah, the DCP is definitely a cheaper thing for the industry. It is something that arguably uh, is protected against piracy through increased security blah 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 but if you want my personal opinion this thing is is has i don't want to say it's ruined the movie going experience but it's definitely put a big dent in it but anyway movies are not just being made for dcps you also as you very well know uh movies are now in increasingly made for domestic consumption home video consumption uh, so a couple of popular ones that have come and, in some cases, gone over the last 20-something years are cell phones, uh, Netflix, DVDs, and, of course, good old-fashioned torrents like Pirate Bay. Not that I can actually tell you anything about them, so just there for educational purposes. But these things have all fundamentally ch made it easier to access a wide range of movies that have been made from virtually every corner of the world and in every time that films have been made. It's seemingly all available for these platforms. Now that's a little bit of an exaggeration. There's a lot of really wonderful films that 
have never found their way onto any of these these platforms. Uh, Netflix in particular is awful about curating any films that are made before 1985. But it is true that these technologies have made it so that films that were once only accessible on first-run release or if you went out of your way to go to a film archive are now seemingly available at just the click of a button. And so it's a really interesting thing uh, to think about and study, and I've done a lot of research on this question in my dissertation and in my, my other work, um, but it has fundamentally changed not just what kinds of movies we can access, but of course, what kinds of films are even made to begin with. So a couple of recent examples of this, the way that these home video technologies have led to different kinds of films being produced are uh, direct to video-ish films like the Saw franchise. And I, I say ish because movies like Saw or from an earlier period, Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th or arguably some of the Marvel superhero films that are have been produced – they're hoping that a certain number of people go and see these films in theaters, but these movies are getting money and financing on the basis of their potential to be hits on home video. So the assumption is that effectively for every one person who sees Thaw or a film like that in a movie theater, you're going to have 10 or even 15 more who see it on Netflix or who buy the DVD or in the earlier moment had the VHS tape. And so it has really changed and what a lot of filmmakers will think and sort of see themselves as doing. It's basically created new new possibilities for new kinds of films. Uh, another recent example is Martin Scorsese's film, The Irishman, which would have been impossible to make without Netflix because, in effect, it is a TV miniseries masquerading as a film. And I don't mean that as criticism, but this is a movie that is very aware that most people who are going to watch it, and I think you can say this about most of Netflix's films, they are profoundly aware that they are going to be watched at home. And in Scorsese's case, what it has done is it's enabled him to make a nearly four hour episodic, almost meandering film about these old dying gangsters and all of the gret the regrets they have for, for killing folks. So anyway, both, both of these are great. Check them out. But we're getting into very quickly the last question that I want to touch on, and this is the one that will directly bear on our film for this week, Searching. But how have digital technologies changed the storytelling process? How have these new technologies in the realm of production and these new assumptions about how people are going to watch movies, how have they changed the basic work of what filmmakers do? Well, again, huge question. So I'm only going to give y'all a few thoughts on this question, but I freely admit at the outset that there is a lot that I have not going to touch on in, uh, in the next couple of slides. So feel free to contribute some of that knowledge about what other things come to mind in your responses. Just just feel free to say, oh, here's some other ways that digital technologies have changed how movies tell stories. But one really important one that I do want everybody to know is David Bordwell's idea of intensified continuity. And this is a term that Bordwell coins in the article that you will read for this, this week's film. Uh, that has really caught on because it seems to describe a wide variety of different films and filmmaking practices that have become commonplace in Hollywood over the last 25 years. But what is intensified continuity? Well, here's the uh, textbook definition for y'all. Intensified continuity is really just describing how a range of stylistic devices quote unquote, amp up the pace of Hollywood storytelling while, and this is the critical part, 
while preserving classical story principles. So it is exactly what it, what it says. It is intensified continuity storytelling. So let's, let's pause here and just very quickly review those classical story principles that I introduced to you several weeks ago when we were looking at Casino Royale. And again, partial list, but some of the big things that you remember from that lecture on Casino Royale are the idea of a three-act structure, goal-oriented characters who have very clearly defined motivations and reasons for doing things. Narration is often organized around a very simple, this happens, and then this happens, and then this other thing happens structure so that you understand how events cascade and lead to other events, and it all builds to a resolution, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, the last thing is the invisible style, the idea that you are fundamentally meant to notice the story and not the way it is being told when you watch one of these movies. So here's, here's the thing. Most of these principles are still in force and can still apply to 90% of the things that Hollywood makes. But here's what you have in addition to those classical storytelling principles that are still in force uh, 100 years later. You have more rapid and non-linear editing. You have editing where, even though it preserves some measure of spatial and temporal continuity, is speeding up the tempo so that you have a hard time grasping what any one shot is doing unless you're watching the movie frame by frame or shot by shot on DVD or on Netflix. You are more likely, uh, Boardwell says, to have distorted lens lengths, way more fisheye lenses and what telephoto lenses you being used to distort space. You are much more likely to have extremes of lens length in these contemporary Hollywood cinema. The other thing that goes along with that is extremely close framings. You get way more extreme close-ups and tilted angles and just cinematographers really underlining their contribution to the craft of storytelling. And then the last thing that you see, according to Boardwell, is a free-ranging camera. So much more likely to see a like GoPro kind of uh, camera being mounted on somebody who's maybe running after a guy and just you're, you're seeing all of these things being added into the arsenal of tools that Hollywood filmmakers have at their disposal. And again, 90% of the time, these things are being used to support those traditional goals of storytelling that I outlined a moment ago, three act structure, goal-oriented characters, uh, the cause-effect narration, and invisible style is arguably the only one that gets muddled in a lot of these films. But even there, you can say that these film, these techniques don't necessarily call attention to the filmmaking process in the same way that like a documentary or an art film like like Grizzly Man or uh, Girl Walks Home Alone at Night is calling attention to film as film. Some examples to make this a little bit more concrete. Uh, the, the Bourne films or virtually any big budget action film starring a major Hollywood star. So I could have just as easily put some of the Marvel films on the slide and, and it, the point would still stand. Uh, but one that you have seen very recently for this class is Casino Royale, which is actually, I think, a textbook example of Boardwell's idea of intensified continuity. Uh, because you see in virtually every fight scene all of the things that Boardwell is describing. You see extremely fast editing. You see an extremely fluid mobile handheld camera. You see other things being used to uh, distort the normal rules of Hollywood filmmaking. Uh, the fight scene at the beginning is a great example because it's in black and white. But later in the film, uh, when Bond is poisoned, you have oversaturated images, you have a camera that is tilting left and right in crazy, fast, and unpredictable ways. 
in the bottom image, you have a very clear wide angle lens being used to bring Daniel Craig's uh, stressed out, sweaty face closer to the camera lens and create this distorted effect. But fundamentally, the film is still doing traditional Hollywood things, as I outlined in the lecture from a few weeks previous. So again, it's, it's something that is not often radically opposed to traditional Hollywood filmmaking, but rather intensified continuity is exactly what it says. It is a process for intensifying and speeding up and ramping up and making conventional storytelling principles seem faster and more intense. So that's big term number one. Big term number two, which is not described in any of the readings uh, that I made you check out for these uh, for this week. But if anybody is interested in learning more about remediation, come come talk to me. Uh, I, I will I will give you way more information than you ever wanted to know about this subject because this is fundamentally where a lot of my own research uh, lives. So I wanted to let you know a little bit about this concept because I think it really does explain so much about what is happening in contemporary Hollywood films or films of the last 25 years. But remediation is a term that scholars use to describe how films emulate or incorporate stylistic elements from other media. So here's some common things that films remediate. You have films remediating video games, comic books, television, social media, the internet, and that's that's just a partial list. You also have movies remediating board games and, of course, literature of all sorts and stripes. Uh, virtually every media that is out there is prime for films to remediate, to, to take things from and pull into its own functions as a medium. But I'm foregrounding these because if you look at a lot of the big Hollywood films of the last 20 years, you will notice that many of them are remediating in one way, shape, or form one or more of these other media. We have really shifted to a franchise logic in the last 25 years. But some examples. Uh, video games. Uh, I... Don't know if I can recommend either Gamer or Hardcore Henry as like quote unquote good movies because they they very much do deviate from some of the tried and true storytelling principles that I outlined a moment ago. But theoretically speaking, these two things are fascinating because you see in these films and in so many others, uh, filmmakers trying to make their medium more palatable to video gamers, which is a really fascinating idea when you think about how the two media do very, very different things. And they are not necessarily as aligned in their what they can do as uh, we sometimes like to think. And these two films really are exploring that very directly on the level of narrative content and on the level of form. So if you like film theory, you should check these movies out because they're great. Comic book movies, I'm sure that many of you have seen some of the Marvel films, which are notable for going back through the backlog of comic books that have been produced and taking all of these great stories about these like superheroes who are, in some cases, very well known and beloved, and in other cases, are much more cult much more likely to be cult favorites but you see the marvel films going back to those comic books for their story material uh, and on the other side of the spectrum you see things like uh 300 or watchmen that are not only taking story material from comics but are actively emulating the appearance visually speaking of of comics so check these two out these are great uh, and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about, because this leads directly into searching, are the phenomena of movies that are dealing with the internet and with social media. So again, uh, another sort of form content split here, but you have films like David Fincher's The Social Network 
that are directly dealing with digital technology on the level of content. The Social Network is a movie about the making of Facebook, but you don't really spend a lot of time looking at computer screens in The Social Network. That is very much not the focus of the film. The focus of the film is on the personalities of people like the Jesse Eisenberg, Mark Zuckerberg character. Um, Other films are, however, much more likely to incorporate digital social media stuff on the level of form. And so that's where you get things like Unfriended, which is basically the horror film version of Searching where you spend virtually the entire time looking at a computer screen. And then, of course, a film like what we watched this week, Searching, which is very much taking uh, social media and the personas that we create for ourselves on the internet as its subject matter, but is also on the level of form, actively duplicating the experience of being at a computer screen and scrolling through a bunch of tabs and having multiple screens up and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the interesting thing about searching and one of the reasons why I like to end the course by watching this film is because it is a wonderful marriage of old and new meaning that it is a film that is deeply embedded in classic storytelling traditions that go back, in some cases, 100 100 years. Um, I love how this poster is praising the film's Hitchcock levels of suspense, and it's it's a really apt comparison to liken this movie to a classical Hollywood thriller. Because if you line it up side by side with something like Vertigo, or even to some degree something like Casino Royale, you do see the same story tropes being recycled and repurposed, particularly the idea of the man who has to rescue the woman. That old storytelling trope that we talked about several weeks ago is very much at work in Searching. And it, of course, also has a very clean three-act narrative structure with a clear beginning, middle, and an end, and it's very cause-effect oriented. It's a very classical film. But yet, on the other hand, it is a very inventive film that is using its story as an excuse, in part, to theorize and think about what happens to film in this new media environment where it competes for our attention with so many other supposedly more interactive forms of media. So that's the really what you should be thinking about when looking at the film, is just how it is marrying and blending very traditional storytelling tropes on the one hand with a radically inventive way of rethinking how a movie can tell its story in this new media environment that we have. So pause here and give you a little bit of background about the film, because I think that some of this this inventiveness can be attributed to how the film is being made by a major Hollywood studio, but also by a very young filmmaker who is coming to the industry from a background that is going to be increasingly common for filmmakers, i.e. the tech industry. So Anish Shiganti, uh, who directed this film, he rose to fame in 2015 when he made this really great little short film for with Google Glass called Seeds. And it's available on the internet. You should definitely go check it out. It's only about a minute long. But it's it's something where from I, I, I love this detail because it underscores how much uh, from the very beginning this guy is is who is only I think 26 when this film is being made. So he's very young. He's as young as Orson Welles was when he made Citizen Kane. And you see a similar impulse that in in Shiganti that you actually see in Orson Welles, where you have these two young guys who are associated much more closely with another medium. In Wells' case, radio. In Shiganti's case, uh, the internet and Google Glass. 
coming to Hollywood and being given more or less total freedom to make a Hollywood style movie, but doing whatever the hell they want to with these fancy new technologies that the people who are hiring them don't know nothing about. And I don't know if I would go so far as to say that Searching is as great of a film as Citizen Kane, because only time will tell whether it has the same longevity and impact that that Kane has had. But it certainly has the same enthusiastic spirit, the same spirit of let's not just tell this story, but let's let's think about how we can remake and reimagine what the medium of cinema can do. Um, and it's just, it's a really, really exciting film. I, I really enjoy watching this film every time I see it. And this is also partly due to the fact that uh, Shiganti has a wonderful leading man in John Cho, who, again, if you're looking for ways that this film is blending old and new, look no further than the way that they have managed to use John Cho and his very likable persona as a kind of like fun sort of dorky kind of guy to like flesh out and complicate the archetype that if you really kind of zoom out, he occupies in this film, which is the father who rescues his daughter from uh, all sorts of bad stuff. Um, so it's an interesting way, like his performance is really interesting. The way his character is conceptualized is is really great. And a huge shout out to him for having to act this way. I mean, having spent a semester, many of us acting and sort of performing for our computer cameras, uh, I have a renewed respect for how natural John Cho makes the process of acting in by himself effectively feel and seem in this movie. So again, ways that digital technologies are changing the acting process. It, run, it runs pretty deep. But one last shout out, Nishiganti has another movie coming out, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, called Run. And I just check out the trailer. It looks really cool. But I wanted you to know about this. This looks, this is, he's a, he's a face to watch. All right. So this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Suggested journal prompts. Um, don't, feel compelled to write about all three of these, uh, pick one or, or two. Um, my suggestion would be to write about one of the new principles that you learned about today, intensified continuity or remediation, and also answer the first question talking about what elements of classical Hollywood storytelling you see in the film because hint hint this is how i know who made it to the end of the lecture there will absolutely be a question on the exam asking you to talk about what classical story principles outlined in the casino royale lecture and recapped here are appearing in searching so if you write about that now you will have one less question to study for the exam all right, y'all. Uh, that is all the good shit. So I am hopeful that you learned something, that you enjoyed listening to me talk. Uh, have a good one, y'all. Just shoot me an email if there's any questions. Catch you, catch you on the flip side.